Okay, so I'm Brian Overby. I'm Ally Invest Senior Options Analyst, and I'm an, also the author of the Options Playbook, which I should be holding right now, but uh, they managed to slip away <laughs> in the other investor's hands, so I don't have a playbook to show you, but uh, we'll show you the website, optionsplaybook.com. It covers all the strategies that we're going to look at today. So we're going to take a look at the Greeks, the third part of this series, and we're going to look at the Greeks a little bit more as not as a, a market maker would on how to hedge your portfolio, but we're going to look at it as when you're picking your strategy. As a matter of fact, we're not even going to really care about the underlying. And everything that we talk about today, not meant to be a recommendation. We're just going to look at a scenario on underlyings that trading the Greeks is better than other underlyings. And so we're going to be dealing with higher price stocks. We're going to look at earnings. We're going to talk about what happens as expiration approaches. But before we get too far, uh, if you want any of the slides, you can actually email me at theoptionsguy@invest.ally.com. Uh, inside my playbook, I'm referenced as the options guy. If you do that, I'll send you all of my PowerPoints for all three of my presentations. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. We're, we're all over the place. Uh, Ally Invest on Twitter. My handle's Brian Overby. And also follow us on Facebook with Ally. Um, so let's get started here. And I'll talk a little bit about the offerings from, from Ally. But now we need to go all the way back to the beginning. And here we go. So I do have to, we are a broker, so we do have disclaimers, and I do need to point out that if you are going to be trading options, you want to review the characteristics and risks of standardized options. You can find it at ally.com slash invest slash disclosures. And everything that we talk about today is not meant to be a recommendation. We're, uh, you can lose your entire investment when you're trading options, and you want to make sure that this strategy is, fits into your portfolio and your outlook for the marketplace. All right. So the Black-Scholes pricing model, we showed this in the last two presentations that we did. Inside the Black-Scholes pricing model, we have all these different variables. And it doesn't matter what pricing model there is, they're all using these, these specific variables inside the model to come up with the price of your option contract. Now, every one of these variables has a Greek letter that goes with it. And that Greek letter tells you, well, how will your option price move if the price of the stock changes, if it risk-free interest rate changes, if the rate of return of volatility changes, if time to expiration changes. So what uh, the models have done is they've separated out these variables and we call those, those variables the Greek to give you a feel that if this particular part of the underlying stock changes, uh, how that is going to uh, affect your options price. So. To define them, we have, uh, here's a, the textbook definitions of the Greeks. We're not going to necessarily stick with them. I still don't like this. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're, we're gonna, these are the textbook definitions of the Greeks. We got delta, gamma, theta, vega, and I just put this up here just as a summary, but we're going to go through one at a time. So if we look at delta, Here's the textbook definition of delta. Delta is the amount theoretical options price will change. Now remember, this is always in theory that we're dealing when we're talking about pricing models. Uh, theoretical options price will change for a one point change in the price of the underlying stock. So I'm gonna walk through a little scenario here. Let's say we have the stock at 50, we have the strike of 50, we have a three month call option trading for $3. My question to you is, if the stock, if we go from 50, and we buy this stock and go from 50 to 51, how much will this option contract move? It's a three month option contract. And the answer is it'll go up about 50 cents. Now, what's more important is that not only will it go up 50 cents, the next point move when it goes from 51 to 52, now it's gonna go up by 60 cents, all right? How do I know that? Well, I just knew what the delta is. And the delta is dynamic. As we get further and further in the money, the delta becomes larger and larger. You go further and further out of the money, the delta becomes smaller. The general rule of thumb is that at the money option contracts have a delta of around 50. And if it's a put delta, it's gonna be a negative 50. 
But what happens when you're talking about calls and you're talking about puts, they have to, in the theoretical world, if the call delta is 40, what does the put delta have to be? Yeah, the, the, then the put delta has to be 60 because it has to add to one, right? So if the call goes up, that's gonna move by 40 cents, the put's gonna move by 60 cents. So in the theoretical world, the, the deltas always match each other on the put side and on the, on the call side. Only difference is with the put, you want the market to go down so it's actually a negative delta, all right? Now, that's all the textbook stuff. What I'd like to know and what I'd like to learn here is I want you to get a feel for delta. So you don't ever have to go to a chain and actually look at the delta and see exactly what it is. I want you to understand how delta moves. And in order for, to have that understanding, I like to bring up the non-textbook definition. This means a lot more to me. This is the way the traders on the, on the Chicago Board Option Exchange right around the corner where I used to work, this is what they always talked about delta. They talked about delta as probability. So this is not a 100% right textbook definition or this is not a 100% accurate definition, but if you understand this definition, you'll understand delta better. So delta, delta is the probability of the option being in the money at expiration. Say it again, delta is the probability of the option being in the money at expiration. So if the stock is at 50 and the strike is at 50, what's the delta based off of that? It's 50, right? We've already determined it. But if you think of it, why is it 50? Well, if it goes up one, it's in the money. If it ticks down one, it's out of the money. So we got a 50-50 chance of that option contract finishing in the money. That's why the delta is close to 50 in this scenario. If the stock starts going up, it goes up to 51, 52, 53, 54. Now with the 50 strike call option, what's the probability? Well, a lot higher than it just was. And guess what? Delta reflects that. And the deeper we get in the money, the closer delta approaches one, and that's the highest that it can get. You'll never have a delta higher than what the actual derivative is, right? So if the stock goes up one, you make one on the stock, you can't make two on the option, right? Some people kind of chuckle at that, but a lot of people kind of have that feeling. It's a derivative, it's derived from the stock price. So the largest the delta could be is one. That means you have a one-to-one -one correlation with the stock price movement. All right, so that is the basics of delta. Now, I wanna take it to the next level because we're gonna use delta to think about our strategy. I'm gonna actually go through two paper trades today um, that, uh, with the stocks that are announcing earnings this week. And we're gonna focus on delta in the diagonal trade. And, I, and I'll get into that a little bit. Now, this is really important to understand to show why we chose that diagonal trade that we're gonna do today. Stock is at 50, strike is at 50, let's change it up. It's no longer a three-day, uh, three-month option contract. Let's say it's one day to expiration. Stock is 50, strike is 50. My question to you is, one day to expiration, knowing the non-textbook definition, what's the delta, right? Wow, it really got quiet in here. 25. 25, okay, so here we got 25. No, no, Anybody? 25. What is it, 0. 0.5? Five. Five. 0. 0.5. 50. 50. 0. 0.5 or 50. 0. 0.5 or 50. God, we got, we got a good market going on here. Sold. <laughs> Anybody else? Closer to, one. Closer to one. Okay. Anybody else? We got, we got 50. We got one. So you, you guys can obviously trade with each other here. Yeah. Right? Any, 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 any others? Nobody wants to play in my reindeer games? All right. The answer is 50. Exactly. He said one, so he's a bull on the market because for it to be one, it needs to get in the money, right? So he's assuming that it's gonna go in the money and that's why he's saying one. But at this moment, with one day remaining to expiration, you cannot get a more 50 delta than this option contract. It's not 51, it's not 52, it's 50. Why? Because you have one day's worth of trading. If it finishes one cent in the money, that's in the money. And the probability is 100% that it's going to be in the money, right? If it's one cent out of the money, the probability is very low. So the delta right here is 50 until that stock makes the next tick. And then what's going to happen with that delta? Thinking of, just thinking of time and how delta moves through time. Think about this. 
Okay, so right now the, stock, the delta is at 50. We have established that. We talked about the 60-day delta. That delta was also at 50. Honestly, if you want to be a little bit more accurate, this is maybe 52 or 53, and it deals with the time value of money. And that's it, not, not, but I don't want to get into that because that's not important and why we're going to learn about delta, okay? But we're going to call it 50, just for sake. So now my next question to you is, let's move the stock. Let's move the stock to 51. Wow, all right, we're a good stock picker. Now, what's this delta? Now you get to speak. What was your answer before? One, right, now we're one point in the money. What's the probability with one day remaining being one point in the money that this option contract will stay at least one cent in the money by expiration? Very high, right? As a matter of fact, it's not quite one at this point because we still got one day remaining. The delta is about 90 in this instance. There's a 90% chance. So because of that, this option contract, and here's the point, this option contract moves fast. This is why people like to buy near-term at-the-money option contracts, right? This is what excites it. Is that not the option contract that usually has the most vol volume in it? The reason why is that if you're correct on your forecast, your option contract very quickly starts acting like the underlying stock, and you get a one-for-one -one movement on your position. Now, let's say that the opposite way, too. If I'm selling option contracts, this hurts right because if it goes against me and you're in the short term it goes against me fast so you got you know a couple of things here that are working you got to think about how that delta moves and what i want to accomplish in my strategy as expiration approaches now just to finish the slide here we'll see that there's a lot of difference between a 60-day option contract and a one-day option contract you might not you look at it on the price but I want you to think more about delta. Delta matters more to me than the price of the option. Because I, I, I know what I need my strategy to do if my forecast is correct. And I need to understand how this delta thing works in order to make sure that I'm picking the right expiration. All right? And that's the whole moral to the story on delta. Much different, much different than looking at the textbook definition, trying, oh, I want to be delta neutral and all these fancy terms. All I want you to do is think about when I'm doing a strategy, how is my delta going to change based on the expiration that I've, that I've chosen? All right? And we're going to look at a live trade and talk about that. All right. Now, XYZ. So the stock is at 103.27. And all I'm going to do is just kind of highlight we have an eight day option contract and we have a 42 day option contract. And I'm just going to point out the things that I just said about delta, right? So the 105 strike here is about two points out of the money, a little, little less than that. But it's only got eight days remaining. So that's two points out of the money. It's out of the money. So this delta is going to be lower than this delta, right? This one has 42 days remaining to expiration. That delta is going to be a little bit lower. Why? Well, the reason is that with 42 days remaining, Time is on my side, right? I want it to finish in the money, and now it's out of the money, so the probability is higher, so I actually get more delta on this option contract when it's out of the money. Now, the opposite side, right? We go and we say, okay, the 100 strike call is three points in the money. That delta is 76 on the eight-day option, and it's only 64 on the 42-day option contract. So I'm just emphasizing what we just talked about, the fact that if I go further out in time and buy in the money, I get less delta. A lot of people think, oh, I want to go out further in time because uh, I want slower time decay, right? But also you get a slower moving option contract. So this is usually when I talk about long straddles. I don't like to do a lot of long straddles overall, not to each their own, but if I'm doing a long straddle, what expiration do I want to choose? First of all, if I'm doing a lot, let's say, what is a long straddle? It's probably, I should probably pull up the options playbook right now. So let's do that. I don't even think I put that tab up yet. So this is actually the, the website for the options playbook. That's moving really slow, obviously. But uh, 
this is a book that I authored, and the website's free for all. There's, there's no login, there's no anything. All the content is, is on the website. Um, but a long straddle means that I'm going to buy a long call and buy a long put, and I'm looking for the, the market to really move. So I'm looking here, long straddle. Okay, so I want a big movement in the underlying. All right, so when do you usually buy long straddles? Earnings, news events, right? When you know the stock's gonna really move. So what expiration do you think you'd wanna buy if you're buying a long straddle? Would I rather buy a two month expiration or would I rather buy a one week expiration? One week, based off of what we just said, that makes sense, right? A lot of people will go out and buy a two month expiration. Why is that? Oh, they're worried about time decay. They're worried about volatility, right? What if volatility comes off and it crunches my front month option contract? But also realize that if I buy a long straddle and I'm correct on my forecast, I, once again, I'm not thinking of the strategy and what I want my options to do for me. So if I buy that long straddle, and let's do this. One more. Okay, so if I buy this 60 day long straddle and, I, and the stock starts moving, the call's gotta make up for all the losses on the put, right? If I'm correct and say the market's moving on the upside. Well, in this instance, all of a sudden, instantly my call goes to a one delta and every single point movement, I'm getting that one delta. If I'm in the longer term option, I'm at 60 and guess what? It starts slowing down as I get, as I get deeper and deeper in the money. Now I'm at 65 on the next point movement or I'm at 60, then I'm at 65, then I'm at 68, then I, I'm gonna have to go three or four points in the money before I get this delta to get to one, all right? And I paid more for it. So I'm just, I'm not saying that there's a golden book of answers, but if you think of delta, buying the short term makes sense because you're worrying about time decay, you're worrying about stuff, but you don't care about that, right? Because you're gonna get out as soon as the earnings are done. So you need to buy the right option contract that will reward you if you're correct. And a long straddle is, is a great example of people that overthink it when you're buying option contracts. You know, a lot of people all over time, I hear them, oh, if you're buying long straddles, you gotta go three, four, five months out. It, it will work if you're correct, but it's not doing what you're trying to accomplish. You need an option that a delta gets to one in a hurry because it's gotta make up for all the losses on the other side. The one correct option contract has to work harder for you, all right? So uh, that, that's one example of a strategy. Now let's go in and let's, what we actually just defined, and this might be the last time you ever say these words, this word again, we just defined gamma. That's actually what we just defined. And a lot of people don't look at gamma, but gamma is the rate of change of delta. Delta is so important, they gave it its own Greek, basically, is what's up. So gamma is the amount of theoretical options delta will change for a corresponding one point change in the price of the underlying. It is highest for near term at the money strike and slopes off for in and out of the money, okay? So if I pull up the chart here on gamma, oh, I guess my next one is the chart. So when we talked about delta, this is actually the Greek letter for delta. When we talked about delta, we defined gamma, right? Because when we looked at the 60 day and the, and the option was at a 50 delta, it went to 60 delta on the first point movement. So what was gamma? Gamma was 10 cents, right? And in this instance, delta went from 50 to 90 and we would have known that if we would have looked at gamma, we would have saw that gamma was 40 and that's what it was in this instance, implying that delta, if it goes one point in the money, gamma was going to increase delta by 40 cents, all right? So that's where these two numbers come from. We just defined gamma. So it kind of makes sense though, uh, what, what my, my second bullet point was, that near-term option contracts have higher gamma. So I just have a chart of a 45 day and a 15 day. It's not an extreme like one day remaining to expiration, but the highest that gamma can get is or the gamma can't push delta beyond one 
and it can't push it below zero, right? So it makes sense that gamma is gonna be the highest on the at the money option, because you got from 50 below and 50 above. So as gamma gets deeper and deeper in the money, it's gonna become smaller and smaller because it can't push delta above that extreme, all right? And also, the shorter that term to expiration, we see a lot less gamma here compared to here, or a lot more gamma on the short term option as opposed to the longer term option. And that's what we showed again in the chart. So that's all you need to know about gamma. We've defined it using delta. Now you don't ever have to talk about gamma again. Doesn't really matter. I just needed you to know that while we were talking about it, that's what, that's what it was called, okay? All right, theta. So theta is the amount a theoretical options price will change for corresponding one day change in the days to expiration. This is the most straightforward of the Greeks. The math actually works. If you look at that Black Shows pricing model slide that we have, you're gonna see a square root of T all over the place. And that actually means, are you guys ready for this? Options move at the square root of time. Anybody need to make a phone call? No? All right, we're all right. Yeah, interesting fact, huh? Well, it actually works. It just, what it really means is that as, uh, as we approach expiration, the rate of decay becomes larger and larger and larger. And I think I have an example here. So you can actually do this math and it does work. If you have a one month option contract and you're in a perfect utopian world, right? We're talking about 360 days in a year. You're only trading 30, 60, 90 day option contracts. The math is simple. If you have a one month option trading for a dollar, well, if the world was logical, if you traded a two month option, that'd be trading for $2, right? We're talking about an at the money option contract, so it's all time value. You'd think, well, if I pay for one month and I pay a buck for it, if I pay for two months, I should pay two bucks. But that's not the case. That's not the way time value works in options. So you actually take one times the square root of two and you get 141. And then if a one month option was trading for a dollar at the money all time premium and you looked at a three month option contract, you'd see that it's trading for 173. So what does this mean to me? If I walk it back, if the stock doesn't move at all, it's an at the money option contract, nothing else changes, no changes to volatility, only time decay happens. We see that when a three month option becomes a two month option, we lose 32 cents. When a two month becomes a one month, we lose 41 cents. And in that last month, we lose an entire buck, right? Wham, my sled hit the tree. It's got to get all the way down to zero if it doesn't move. So it obviously accelerates. In my next slide, I have this actually drawn out. Now this is at the money option contracts, but it obviously accelerates. What have we been talking about this entire presentation? At the money option contracts. So guess what? If you want high gamma, high acceleration, what do you got to get with it? High decay, high theta. The ideal world would be, I, if I'm a buyer of options, I get great acceleration and I get that option contract that delta to one right away and I also get slow time decay, but that doesn't happen. So a lot of people actually, and we have a pricing calculator inside the Ally Invest site that actually quotes theta, theta versus gamma. It actually quotes the rate of change of time decay versus gamma, and some people like that number. I don't think we need to get that fancy, honestly, because that ratio is what option trading is all about. Trying to figure out what is, how much time decay I'm willing to accept to get acceleration, right? So those are the two Greeks. Now, I don't, they call that alpha in some, some platforms and all that, but I honestly don't care. I just want you to understand the concepts and once again, when we get to the strategies, I picked out strategies that are only based on these concepts and they're the easiest to explain as far as the concepts are concerned, okay? So, we're to, I guess we're to the point now. What, what do we got left here? Uh, 1041, okay. So using options to help choose a strategy. So that's what we're gonna do now. So a little known stock, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of them. They're just a, they're just a book selling company. You know, they're, they're called Amazon. You guys ever hear of them? Okay. Well, this is actually this morning. I did this this morning. Once again, I gotta emphasize, this is not meant to be a recommendation by any means. We're just trying to learn about using Greeks when you're picking an option strategy. Okay, 
So you have three days remaining to expiration. You got the July 27th expiration. We're gonna use the near term. And let me, let me, first of all, I guess I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Part of the reason why I picked Amazon wasn't because I care two bits about Amazon or anything about it. I like high price stocks. I like high price indexes. I think one of the worst things that ever happened to options trader, traders is that, Am that Apple did a seven for one split. It was a much better stock to trade when it was a $700 stock than when it did the split and became a $100 stock. And the reason why is that you get some juice in these option contracts. And one of the best things about, and at the money, this is, I went, I, I, first of all, I wouldn't do this trade today because they're gonna be announcing earnings on the 26th. I would do it on the 26th after the close. I wouldn't do this today, right? But we're lecturing today, so we had to use the quotes for today. But when you buy, when you got a, that strike's wrong. So I put the expirations in, but I didn't switch the strikes out. Okay, so I'm gonna have to adjust that. But when you have a $1,800 stock, when you have a $1,800 stock, and you have an at-the-money option contract on Wednesday, it's gonna be worth a lot of money, isn't it? Right? Because of what we talked about in the very first lecture, the more expensive the underlying, the more expensive the options are gonna be. Just like how you'd price your car insurance, remember? Insurance on a Bentley is gonna be more expensive than on a Chevy Cavalier. Same thing in the options world. So, Guess what's great about that? It's really expensive on Wednesday, but by Friday, it's gotta go away, right? So I'm throwing out all these theta models and all this. I know that in the next two days, if I have an at the money option contract trading for like $4 or $5, that thing's gotta go to zero by Friday. So you're gonna get a huge rate of decay relative to a Walmart option. Right, because there's just much more time that has to decay. And that's why I like higher priced underlyings when I'm trying to do a fancy strategy. So I actually got a picture of this one since this is, that kind of got screwed up. I'm just gonna pull it up. So I took a screenshot of the picture, okay. So this was 1832 eight, is where it was at. I looked at buying the 1950 call, selling the 1970s, and buying the 1940s. This is the, the, the strategy right here. It's called a skip strike butterfly, okay? Anybody in here ever trade butterflies? Some people? All right, a few, okay. I like butterflies because they allow you to get into trades inexpensively. And you can pick a direction, they're, they're, they're theta positive. They, if you're correct on your forecast, you want time decay, but you still are paying a debit and you can control that debit by doing butterflies. The biggest downside of a butterfly is that it doesn't pay you that fast because it needs time decay. Butterflies, if you look at this little point that's in this strategy, you never get to that point. Ideally, if you're a good butterfly trader, you'll never get the maximum. Why? Because you shouldn't stick around. <laughs> you should be out of it. If the stock is hanging around that strike price and you're getting close to expiration, you shouldn't just wait and say, oh gee, I hope I get the maximum on the butterfly. Get out of the trade, right? It's time. So you gotta keep that in mind that this profit and loss graph looks beautiful. Look, we're putting this on for a net credit to the account. So the whole way down, if we're wrong and the direction is completely wrong, we make money. But the whole way up, as the market goes up, I can max out here, but then I start losing in this range. Now the difference between the skip strike butterfly and the regular butterfly is when we skip a strike, some people call it modified, I don't like that because you're legitly skipping the strike that you would buy on the normal butterfly. You actually embed a credit spread into the butterfly. Not that big of a deal, but that credit sometimes can pay for the butterfly. And that's what our whole goal is. So when you got a high price stock like Amazon, you got volatilities jacked up because they're gonna announce earnings, you can go way out of the money and do this skip strike butterfly and bring in a net credit to the account, okay? I apologize that I have my slide screwed up, uh, but I didn't change those numbers. Okay, so let's look at this. And let's talk about how we set this up. 
And I'll just go straight to the trade uh, to the LI Invest platform. And first of all, so I talked about this a lot yesterday. We talked about if we're going to do an option contract that, and we're looking at volatility and we're talking about earnings. And yesterday, Google was a great example. Google announced earnings while we were there. We looked at the at the money straddle for the expected move, and guess what? Google actually moved exactly what the expected move was after their earnings. It was, it was anybody in the room? Was that not? It was 54 exactly, and, it, and the market, they announced earnings, and the, the, uh, the stock went up 53 right after they announced earnings. So it's odd enough, but the expected move is what the marketplace thinks based off of volatilities, based off of the line, if you will, if you were thinking of this as a bookie, based off the line, what they think the underlying will move after the earnings announcement, okay? So how do we start by doing that? We just look at Amazon's right here. We buy the most at the money straddle, right? So 123, so I guess uh, 1825 would be the most at the money one that we'd wanna look at. 44, 45, we call it 90 bucks. I had in my notes at the time, I had 86. I had 86 is what the expected move was at that time. Uh, right now it's looking like that's trading close to 90 bucks. Guess we got some bid ass spread in there. But that's what the expected move is. Why do I care? Because when I'm setting up my butterfly, I want it to be feasible to get to that little point in the middle, right? I want it to be feasible. So what's a feasible move? Anywhere around 80 or 90 points after, after this trade. You can go bearish if you want. I'm just gonna go bullish. I have no opinion at all on what Amazon's going to do. But I don't mind this trade because the Greeks are gonna be working for me. So I'm doing this trade mainly as a paper trade here. I'm doing it mainly because of the Greeks, not because of my forecast on Amazon. Does that make sense? Okay, because we have a high price stock, we got jacked up volatility, we got one day remaining to expiration, and that's really big on Amazon because it's a very expensive stock. They announce on Thursdays. In the last four or five quarters, they've always announced on a Thursday. And I'd much rather do it on a Thursday than on a Monday. Why? Because I got one trading day that all that premium's got to come out, right? Because I got a Friday expiration. On Monday, four days worth of Amazon premium is worth a lot. But we got one day, so I really like the fact that Amazon announces after the close on Thursday, all right? And it's all because of theta and all because of gamma and everything that we talked about. So I like Amazon more than I like Google, even though it's basically the same valuation, same everything, because Google announced on Monday, right? I think it was Monday, wasn't it? I'm, right? I'd rather trade the Amazon trade, no matter what my forecast is, because I didn't have a Tuesday expiration in Google, right? Did you kind of get it? All right. You guys don't seem to be embracing this as well as I do. What do you think? You know? All right. All right. So this is the actual trade right now. So when I looked at the trade, when I pulled it up, it was a 90 cent credit. But at the midpoint right now, we're talking about a 63 cent credit to do the skip strike butterfly. And I was able to go, I went, so we were at 86. Um, I went, so 86 was the expected move with the stock at 1833. That would have meant 1,920 would have been approximately my strike on the upside, right? That's a one, if the expected move happened and it opened up 86 points, it would have been about 1920. Now, I got a lot of risk on the upside on this trade, right? If it blows through that expected move and keeps going, that's where my risk is. So I'm gonna go even higher, right? So my first strike that I bought wasn't 1920, I bought the 1940. And my whole goal was to just make sure I could still do this for a decent credit. The further and further I go out, the harder and harder this trade's gonna be to get done for a credit, okay? 
So I went 1940, did 1950. That's a 10 point wide butterfly. So what's the maximum it can make? 10 points. Skipped the 1960 and bought the 1970. And that brought this option price down quite a bit. Now it's only a $4 option because I'd skipped that one strike. I added risk. I added 10 points of risk by skipping that strike. But now I can get this done and this is more accurate on the price. Uh, well, let's call it 80 cents because that's what, what I had in my, in my notes. Okay, so I could get it done for a net credit of 80 cents. Now, if I go back, and I got eight minutes left, and I got uh, I got to quit right away. So here's the profit and loss graph of it. So this is what's real interesting: is this line right now? You think we want to be bullish, right? But if we put this trade on right now, and this is part of the reason why I wouldn't do it today, I'd want to do it on the day of earnings, this is basically delta negative, right? If it starts going this way, we lose money based off of this profit and loss graph. So here's where the stock is at. Here's if we traded it today, profit and loss goes all the way this way, all the way down, and we would be a net loser on this trade if the stock went the direction that we wanted to. Okay, what do we need to happen? All of the Greeks that we just talked about, I would rather do it with one day remaining that says three days. Let's go and put this down to two days remaining, or one day, let's do it. All right, now let's go down to zero days. See what happens there. Ah, it's not moving. But as we get down to zero days, with one day remaining, this thing is going to start curving up like this and get closer and closer to this peak. So what would be the ideal scenario? If we put this trade on and we were correct on our forecast, we would want on the Friday trading, the stock to be right here to open up right there and then slowly trade towards that peak and then I can make 10 bucks on this trade. I don't want it to open at the peak because then I got to make a decision right then, what's going to happen? I would like it to open somewhere in this range and slowly start trading that way as the last day of expiration. If I'm dead wrong, I make 90 cents or 80 cents right now is what it's trading at. Because if it goes down, this whole way down, we did this for a net credit, we have that profitability. So. What I would need to lose on Amazon, and it can do this at earnings, right? I need the expected move, which is 1920. I need it to go up to uh, 1970. So 19, I need it to go 50 more points than the expected move in order to lose the maximum on this trade. But could Amazon open up, what was that, 130 points? It totally could, so don't fool yourself that it couldn't happen. But you got a lot of things working for you on this type of trade. And this is trading with the Greeks. I'm not doing it because I like Amazon. I'm doing it because Amazon's announcing earnings on Friday and it's an $1,800 stock. That's the only two reasons why I'm doing this. I don't care about direction. I could do this on the bear side, but I'm doing it on the call side. Why? If markets go up, what happens to volatility? It comes off faster than if it goes down. I want volatility to go away. So I'm gonna do it to the call side because I don't know where it's going. Right, does that make sense? It's always, always, always about the Greeks. Did somebody ask a question? Can you repeat what you just said about volatility? Okay, when markets go up, implied volatilities have a tendency to come in or go down, right? So I need, Honestly, what I need is this time premium on this option contract, this middle option contract, I need that time premium to go away. And there's two ways it can go away. Volatility comes in or time decays. And if I can get both of them to work for me and I'm correct on my forecast, I'm gonna be more profitable quicker. Okay? All right. So uh, with one day remaining to expiration, this actually would start creeping. It would probably be right about here where it would be at. 
And if it hits that strike, you're just out. It hits the short strike, you just get out. You don't think about it. You don't say, oh, I should get more, right? I should have made more on this trade. You get out because once it starts going against you, this is where your risk is. And you've got a lot of risk. You're trying to make 90 cents and you've you got 10 points of risk, right? So you just get out. Just trust me, get out. Now, I got one other one that I'm going to show you and I got a bolt. I got three minutes. All right, so here's my other strategy that I looked at. And I'll just put it up on the slide. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about it. So um, uh, another FANG stock is Apple. And once again, I like Apple because it's an expensive stock. It's a $200 stock. Now, this is Apple as in Apple, the uh, computer company? Yeah, they make a little product like these. Oh, they no, make I know, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right. Okay. So this, I got three minutes and I got to run because I got to do a WebEx up, upstairs. Okay. So here is the reason why we're doing this trade. We're doing it once again because of the Greeks. So I put it together. I would have liked to have done it a couple of days earlier, but I am going to do a diagonal spread. And I know Apple's going to be announcing earnings. Their earnings are on... Uh, that's not right. On the, on the, Apple is going to be announcing earnings on the 31st. All right. They're going to be announcing earnings on the 31st. So August 3rd contains the earnings. July 27th does not. So I'm going to sell the option that does not contain their earnings. And I'm going to buy an option that does. Why? Once again, it's the Greeks. I think implied volatility is going to increase, and that's actually called Vega, I think it's going to increase as expiration approaches on the back month, and I think it's going to decrease as expiration approaches in the front month. All right? So all I care about is the stock's at 193. If it gets to 195, right, this delta is 28, and this delta is 25. So I ideally would like it to not get to 195, and I'm gonna get a much lower priced 200 strike call. Which, by the way, the 200 strike is within the expected move. The expected move is eight points, right? And the stock is at 193. So I'm trying to get into a long call option at a fairly reasonable price, and if I am wrong, once again, and this thing gets to 195 by the 27th, then all I'm going to do is get out of the trade and the deltas say that I should be about at even. Because I bought a longer term out of the money option, what does that do to delta? Increases it, because it's out of the money, it gives you more time for it to get into money. And I bought a shorter term and received 50 cents for that, but the deltas are pretty even, so if this goes up two points to 195, I should be at about even on the trade, and what do I do? just get out, right? Because my whole goal was that if this, the ideal scenario would be this went to 194.60 and the front month just expired worthless and I was able to stay long that call and hope, hopefully the Delta knock it out of the park. Now, I might be profitable if this gets to 195. Why might I be profitable? There's one Greek that would make me profitable. Vega. It's actually the only one that's not a Greek. It's actually a constellation for some reason. <laughs> but Vega, because Delta says they're going to move in, in lockstep with each other, but implied volatility might increase on this one because it's got that earnings. So once again, I'm thinking of calendar spreads. I'm thinking of time spreads. I do not care about Apple. I'm doing it because the timing is right as far as the Greeks are concerned. All right, got to run. I Like I literally got to run. <laughs> so thanks for coming, everyone. This is when you guys clap. All right.